Well, one person that we have talked to before, but we are bringing back on the show is Ron Olson. He is the chief for the Parks and Recreation Division for the Michigan DNR. Thank you for being with us again, Ron. How are you? Good, good. Thank you much for uh, taking the time to let me uh, join your show. It's always great having you. You are such an outdoors person. Um, for those in the state of Michigan, the outdoors has really been a salvation for so many people. Yes, yeah, we've uh, seen unprecedented amounts of visitation uh, all uh, since spring. We had uh, very large numbers all the way through the summer. And in fact, we were up 25% uh, beyond that. That was on average at just about every park and the camping, lodging and just day use visitation was very, very strong uh, all the way around. And so with that, going into the winter months, obviously Michigan is beautiful and we had an amazing summer. It was incredible, uh, but we are going into the winter months. How will things change for you and your team members as uh, winter sets in? Well, we still have, uh, there's uh, uh, some parks are uh, no longer offer camping opportunities, but we have many places that do. We have cabins and different things. Plus we have rustic campgrounds uh, in the state forest that we manage. There's 134 areas there. And if you can get through uh, with the snow and that kind of stuff, depending on where it is, there's a lot of opportunities for that, uh, for that aspect of recreation. But then we have, you know, uh, various, well, we, now with the emergence of fat biking, uh, there's lots of people that are mountain bikers that switch over and we have a uh, partner with clubs that groom uh, trails as well as cross country trails. We have many locations where they're groomed trails uh, when, when the snow is sufficient. And then our snowmobile program kicks off today, as a matter of fact, uh, pending the, the depth of snow. Right now, we talked to the staff in the UP and the snow is not that prolific yet, but we suspect that that will change here uh, over the next few weeks. So, uh, so there's a lot of opportunities to get out and go hiking and do things, but we expect this winter to be every bit as robust as the rest of the summer has been because people really want to get out and getting outdoors is a good, safe option for people. You can spread out and social distancing is not an issue. We just ask people to be prepared, bring their uh, cleaning devices if, uh, and when they go indoors. And now most of them are vault toilets, so they're not you know, flush toilets that they bring sanitizers and their masks and things like that. But other than that, being outside and being patient, spreading out is, is uh, really all it takes. Yeah, and, and like you said, you anticipate there's going to be a larger crowd. Do you think part of that is because people just aren't traveling right now, so they're staying closer to home and staying closer to Michigan? Yeah, that's true. Uh, although there are people that have, because of teleworking and things like that, that have that have dwellings, uh, cabins or camps or something elsewhere in the state. Some are just stay there and they operate. So I think you'll see people, the, the some of those dwellings will remain in use as opposed to the fact that typically people would close them up and go back home. So I think that the use dynamics uh, because of that will change a lot for those that have that opportunity. But I, I do think though that based on our what we've seen this summer, there'll still be people questing to go to the, see the, the frozen falls at Taquaman and things like that, that are pretty unique uh, for various kinds of trips. So we expect to see a kind of, a, an, again, a continuing upsurge in, in uh, visitation. Yeah, that is definitely on my bucket list to see the falls. I haven't been there yet. How does it work with some of the cabins? Do you rent them online? Uh, what is that like and how often um, do you anticipate you're going to book up early? Well, we have, uh, I'll give you an example at Wilderness State Park. It's a very popular uh, venue and if people are interested, they need to plan ahead and uh, go online to our um uh, reservation system and you can you can prompt that on just going Michigan DNR and that'll take you to the web page and you can go to reservations and uh, 
but those are very popular. People ski between them and uh, things like that. And uh, but they're scattered throughout the state, uh, and it's a different experience. Uh, all the way up to the Porcupine Mountains, we do have yurts as well as cabins up there, and it's a different experience because of the fact it's a much bigger landscape. And and but you have to be prepared and bring, uh, you know, be prepared with the right, uh, uh, belong, you know, your clothing and and boots and things like that. Well, does that kind of concern you as well that you'll get a lot of people that aren't experienced with the outdoors coming up and not taking the needed safety precautions? Yes. Uh, in fact, interesting you mentioned that is last summer we had more uh, backcountry or wilderness rescues at the Porcupine Mountains than we ever had ever. And we believe that a lot of the folks that were so eager to get out that they went and heard about that place and went hiking and uh, didn't have the, the proper uh, kinds of things and went out and got turned around and got lost and certainly up in places like that cell phones don't always work and so consequently you need to have backups like compasses and kind of old school devices or a device that that is a GPS based type of situation where you can navigate yourself uh, or the batteries wear out and you're not prepared for that. So we expect people to to make sure they are prepared and have backup systems because uh, things like that, especially in the winter time when it gets cold, you want to, you know, just have that have that backup plan. Ron Olson with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the chief for the Parks and Recreation Division with the Michigan DNR. Piggybacking off of that uh, topic and that conversation, Ron, what are the types of old school safety devices people should pack if they are going to be coming uh, to one of our state parks and taking advantage of the winter months? Well, I think first of all, it starts with clothing. I think having, you know, the proper layering of clothing and avoiding, you know, uh, cotton kinds of things and the typical kind of hooded sweatshirts and things like that that might seem okay, but once they get damp and wet, it can really go backwards. So layering up and you having fabric next to your skin that wicks the sweat away from yourself is one thing. Having uh, layered gloves and having spares that you could do in case you get something wet, you could put them in a little pack and then have way to exchange. Particularly your hands and feet are are very important. And, and then uh, your you, a lot of heat escapes through your head, so having a decent uh, uh, couple of hats is not a bad idea as well. And then certainly having a hydration, uh, even though you might think in the, the winter time that you don't need to hydrate, though that's, you know, you do uh, expel a lot more energy in the winter time. And so having a way to drink fluids and being prepared and also, you know, to eat before you go. and kind of just general things like that so you don't get uh, uh, a box dinner and then you certainly can bring you know energy bars and things like that depending on how far you go but uh, and you know like I said trying to keep your feet dry and that means that having the right boots as well that are comfortable and that are either Gore-Tex or some other type of fabric that would repel uh, moisture. Ron Olson with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. It's so much better to overpack and bring those things just in case you do need them. You know, it's so sad this time of year going into the winter months, we always hear about the tragic accidents involving snowmobilers. Uh, do you want to um, talk a little bit about that and the safety measures with snowmobiling? Right. Uh, we call it Ride Right, and it's a campaign that we've partnered with the uh, uh, some 80 snowmobile clubs in the state. One of the primary causes of, of serious accidents and even deaths on snowmobile, probably 75 to 80% of them are alcohol related. And uh, because people uh, stop over or whatever and uh, tip a few and then take off on their snowmobile. And many of these units can go very fast and, uh, and you get carried away and most of them go around a turn and they misjudge the turn and go
go off and hit a tree or something. So we're asking people to ride right, to respect that just like you would in a automobile and not drive while you're uh, under the influence for your safety as well as others because the trails aren't that wide and you don't want to certainly run into anybody. But, uh, but just to anticipate, we do have confidence markers on the trails to keep you so you can keep track of where you are and to stay within the, uh, the, the um, groomed tracks. But we know a popular activity now is to do free riding uh, and go up down, up and down hillsides and on, on ungroomed snowpack. And if you're, I would suggest that if you're not skilled at that sort of thing to probably not to do that or to take it very slow and to learn about that because you can tip over very easily and things like that. So, but I think in the main, you know, there's plenty of information out there for snowmobilers. There's a whole uh, snowmobile safety book uh, as well as ORVs, I might add, uh, to pay attention. And again, like I said on the others, be prepared. And especially if it's your first time out is to take it easy and, and get used to things and, and uh, kind of work into it rather than, going full blast right off the bat, which is sometimes people's enthusiasm uh, gets ahead of their uh, their kind of stability in terms of uh, getting their bearings, if you will, to get, get things going in the right direction. Uh, Ron, quickly before we let you go, um, when ice, fish, ice fishing becomes such a popular sport here in the state of Michigan as the winter months start to set in, um, snowmobiling out on the lakes as well. When do you know the ice is safe? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think, first of all, you need to know the body of water because even if you have substantial three to five inches, six inches of ice, uh, sometimes the currents and the way the water works in the lake can be deceiving. So first of all, is to do your research and make sure you understand and know that. and. Uh, if you're not sure, I'd go and uh, drill a hole and make sure that you're, you're aware of that. There are plenty of charts that say that, but and then there's good ice and not good ice and things like that. So I would say to take a little time to learn about some of those basic safety precautions. And I, and I would say when in doubt, don't do it because you're sinking a snowmobile in a, in a lake or going through the ice is a is a life-threatening experience and it's not worth taking a chance. So I would, most of the people, you know, and when I've done it, you kind of look around and see what other people are doing and you try to talk to the local people, uh, either at bait shops or otherwise, and the, you know, you'll find out very quickly what what's going on in that regard. Uh, but it's always be uh, better to be safe than sorry. Good words to lead with. Ron Olson, thank you so much for taking time out of uh, your Tuesday to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you very much and uh, hope everybody has a fun, uh, enjoyable winter outdoors. Absolutely. Take advantage of what is in our backyard, but be safe while you're doing it.